Okay, so I am actually very lucky I'm speaking towards the end of this school because there were wonderful talks done by my predecessors about various aspects of statistical physics, so which makes my life much easier because I can just use these things without having to spend time introducing them and explaining. So that's, that's one nice thing. And uh, the other thing I want to say is that this talk will be slightly different than what we've heard so far. Because in most of the talks that we heard so far, we were looking at some biological systems and we were trying to understand how they function, what they do, etc. In what I'm going to tell you about, we are not going to do that. We are going to start, we are going to be more material scientists in some sense. And so we're just going to start from a model of particles and, and I'll introduce in a, in, a, in a bit. And we're just going to try to build systems that mimic uh, properties that living systems have, okay? Therefore the title artificial living matter. And um, to be actually be able to do that, you're going to be constantly solving so-called inverse statistical physics uh, problems. So statistical physics problems you've heard of, the, the inverse one, it's not that you start, uh, you start from a system and then figure out how things function, but uh, you, you try to, you take building blocks and try to figure out what kind of interactions you need to give those building blocks such that when they come together, they show properties that you're interested in. So it's slightly different, it's in inverse. And in this first talk, I'm just going to talk a little bit about self-assembly and just specificity of interactions and say basically what uh, we've been trying to do and spend most of the time on introducing the physical model system and the building blocks I'll be, I'll be using. Okay, and um, so by listening to all of you, all the previous talks, I, I got very excited because I realized this is going to be a perfect uh, moment to, a perfect thing for me, of course, to, to ask for your input and your help. Because, so, as I said, things that I'm going to talk about are going to be material science and just going to use things like interactions and results, et cetera, et cetera. But it would be very nice if you can help me with this. So, figuring out what is a genotype in a system that I'm going to talk about in a model system. What could be a phenotype? What could be mutations? How could we define fitness landscapes and genetic drifts and anything else that we can think of the standard things that we use when we describe biological systems. Um, so I don't use these words in my systems, but it, my system, but it would be very nice if we could do that. So from at the end of the talk, I'll try to talk to you about, about this and hear your, your thoughts about this. Okay, so self-assembly, a process that is very important for this, for sure, for this first uh, lecture that I'm, I'm giving. So it's a bottom-up approach. So it's a, basically a process in which uh, building blocks spontaneously come together, so without any external influence, and they come together and form structures. So this is a very, um, very broad definition. And it's really ubiquitous in general, in nature especially. So here you have um, on one side just lattices. This is just a, 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 a sodium chloride lattice. Here we have a graphene sheet. So they were both made through a self-assembly process. So building blocks, in, so here it is the case of two ions. Here is just one, one type of atom. They came together and formed these ordered structures. And here on the on your right, you can see of biological uh, processes in biology, self assembly processes in biology. So this is a, a typical example of a, of a microtubule. It consists out of two building blocks, the same as sodium chloride, basically that you know stack around and, and grow into this tubule. Here you have a, a transcription factors that we've heard them mentioned uh, a few times throughout these uh, few days. So it's just again 
a complex that is built out of many different parts that, that in a sequence come together and, and form the final, final transcription factor. And here at the bottom, you have an example of a 30S unit of the ribosome. So there is some central RNA uh, strand here. And around it are just proteins that, again, spontaneously come together, attach to this RNA uh, strand, and form the final structure. And um, so self-assembly process, you can see it everywhere. But this is now where things start becoming very interesting. Um, in this case here, we have the interactions between these building blocks are non-specific, meaning that this green ion here, you cannot distinguish it between that one or that one or that one or any other one, right? The same goes with the graphene sheet. And if we go back to the case of the ribosome or other biological systems, so although here you actually have just two building blocks as well, here you have more, they're really not non-specific interactions, right? These, these building blocks interact specifically. They know where they need to go. They're not indistinguishable. They're very much distinguishable. So for the system that we are going to talk about and try to build this artificial uh, system that mimics uh, properties from, from uh, living systems, you're going to need specific interactions. So fortunately for us, these exist in labs in many, many different forms. And so this is one of the very interesting examples. So these specific interactions are realized in the following way. So the, in the Panyin's lab at, uh, at this institute at Harvard, they basically take short strands of DNA, single strands of DNA, and they design them in such a way that they fold. This is the, basically the folded part. And basically look like Lego pieces in some sense. So there are binding sites here on one side and here on the other side. And they can design them in such a way that they, these building blocks, these Lego pieces, come together uh, in a specific way. And in this paper in 2012, they had, I think, 1,000 different uh, Lego pieces that they can that they can make and that can form structures with them. Nowadays, I think they have over ten thousand, and it's just small pieces of DNA strands with sticky ends. Yeah, I should have said so these pieces parts here are so-called sticky ends. And so, if a complementary, if a Lego piece with a complementary DNA strand comes in, it will glue to it and form bonds, so the interactions are specific, which is very important. Now, DNA can be also used so as a building block, but also as a, a glue itself. So this is from Chad Merkin's lab at Northwestern. So basically what they do is they take particles, these are nano-sized particles, and they just glue DNA on their surface. Okay, so we just, the, the, again, single strands of DNA. And then if two particles come together, they will bind only if they have complementary strands on them. And if they do that, they can, they can basically show how they can design these interactions such that they see variety of, of lattices. And, okay, so we can say, okay, lattices, but we see that in nature. We don't need, you know, DNA, <laughs> DNA coated particles to see that. But they can see a variety of lattices that are not typically seen nature. They can just design them because they understand how to design these building blocks. Now, this uh, putting a DNA as a glue can be done also on a slightly larger scale. So this was nanoparticles. They can do it also with microscopic particles. I hope this movie works. These are mi microscopic particles. So these are uh, micron size, around the micron size uh, colloidal particles, so silica particles that are again glued with uh, pieces of short strands of DNA. Now the scale is of course very different. So here the particles are nanometer size and these DNAs are also uh, in nanometers. And here the DNAs in nanometer and particles are microns. So this really, really short range interaction that we are talking here. And this is very, not showing up very well, but we'll see it again at some, at some point later. But basically they have here 
six different types of particles that were designed in a very peculiar way that they come together and form a structure that looks like this flower. I hope you can see it. If not, on my screen it looks much better. Now, there are other ways to use DNA. And nowadays, everything is, everything is about DNA. So a few years ago, to, to buy one you know, little tube of DNA, it costed millions. Nowadays, it's in order of thousands. So it's very easy to actually do this. And you have these companies where you can just order sequences that you're interested in. They just ship it within one day. So it's very, very easy to do these experiments now. So here, these are not actually hard particles, but are soft emulsion droplets that are coated with DNA. But what is very interesting about these is that the, this DNA can move on the surface of these particles. And this is like the coolest thing ever, I think. The reason is um, that uh, they can control the coverage density of DNA on these particles. And they roughly know how many DNA strands goes into one bond between two particles. So these are these yellow patches. This is a, a green particle and the red one. And so this yellow is just a, a, a contact between the two droplets. And so by controlling the density of DNAs on, on the surface of these particles, they can control valence, okay, which is a really cool thing. So in, in these cases here, there is no valence control. They cover the surface of the DNA, and it's the DNA stuck. Particles can sort of roll and move, but it's still you can attach as many of them as you can pack if they have complementary strands. Whereas here, this is not the case. If one connection takes, I don't know, 5,000 strands, if they pull 10,000, that's a valence of two. If they pull 15, that's a valence of three, and so on. So all of a sudden, we have something that very much looks like you know, atoms and electron clouds. Things are not fixed anymore. They can just they can control valence. And so in, in all the numerical experiments that I work on, I, I assume this experiment is working beautifully. Not yet, but it's getting, it's getting there. But uh, it's just working beautifully because valence control, as it turns out, when you use spherical things, is very, very important. Okay, and then so the last example. Uh, so the the last example of a well, way you can make specific interactions, the ones that are very important uh, if you want to build artificial living matter, are so-called lock and key kind of uh, uh, interactions. So basically, um, if we are basic, they're just basically making puzzle pieces, okay? So on the micron scale, they can make these protrusions in coil particles in such a way that only some, some size of the smaller particles can fit. And then by varying the size ratio between the particles and the size of the holes, they can actually make all kinds of objects these, uh, that interact with these lock and key kind of a, um, Wait. Okay. Okay. So basically, what I told you so far is that the self assembly is a very important process. Biology and nature uses it all the time to make all the things from the bottom up. The very important thing is that it uses um, specific interactions between building blocks that make these, these uh, very nice uh, uh, machines and, and systems. And so the building blocks with specific interactions can be made in a lab, can be made pretty efficiently, and they are on a, a nano and micrometer scale, so we can actually have self-assembly process that governs their, uh, their well, assembly, right? And so in the last several years, what I've been trying to do together with my colleagues is figure out how we can you know, program building blocks to give us specific shapes, how we can program them to have certain functions, and uh, to have some higher order uh, organization. So, um, basically the question that we've been asking are, what are the ingredients or 
we would like always to say what are the necessary ingredients, but not always to show that this is the this is the case. But what are the ingredients needed to achieve any of the functions that we are interested in, and uh, how we want to always understand how we can control these different levels of organization. And of course, the dream is the goal is that by doing all this, we will be able to find out some design rules and laws that are going to be robust and efficient that we could then scale up and use at, at different levels. And of course, the most important thing is that we have building blocks with specific interactions in the lab that we can use. Okay, and so for the rest of the talk, I'm going to talk about the model system that we've been using. And um, it's working. Okay. So, Basically, the model system are just a system of colloidal particles. So these are micron-sized particles that uh, this is a, just an experiment of, of such a system uh, that are just immersed, immersed in a solution. And uh, they are very interesting because even without any specific interactions involved, if you take some fixed number of these particles, when they come together, they form structures, they form they form what mathematicians call a sphere patterns, okay? So the structures that look something, something like this. And uh, these uh, sphere packings is something really that mathematicians have been enumerating for, for decades. And it's very interesting because up to five particles, there is only one structure per number of particles that can be formed. And when I say structure, I mean sort of a rigid structure, so any deformation actually costs energy, okay? And so only at six, at six particles, we start have, seeing degeneracy in the number of different structures we can bind. Now, an interesting thing is up, all up to, I think, um, all up to 10, all of these structures have the same number of bonds between them, so the sort of the potential energy be for all of these structures is exactly it's exactly the, the same. And then the interesting thing is, the interesting thing is the following. This is the work done by Natalie Arcus, who was a PhD student at Harvard. So she was the one who was involved in part of enumerating these structures. And the, the thing is that if you, for example, have six particles here, so you can see two different structures. You can ask a question, so what is the probability, so if I just have, have six particles and put them in my experiment, so what is the probability that I see one structure versus the other? And it's a very simple calculation. You can find what the partition function for a packing is, and we already heard uh, about partition functions and heard about Boltzmann weights, etc. The interesting things come here. So the partition function can be split up into a vibrational part, rotational part, and translational. Translation is the same for all of the structures, so you can approximate it like that. And then here, the, both the potential energy, and as I said, because the bond, the number is the same, up to 10 in each of the fixed system size uh, clusters. The vibrational part is also very much the same doesn't contribute, it doesn't vary very much over the structures. But then there is this rotational entropy part that very much varies from structure to structure. And so just intuitively, if you have, what would be your guess? So if you have a structure that is, uh, in this case, something that is very symmetric and something that is not really symmetric, what would be your intuition? What, if I do the experiment hundreds of times, which one would I see assemble? more, the very symmetric one or the non-symmetric one? Anyone have a guess? Or 50-50? Because as I said, they have the same potential energy and things seem to be the same. I think that anti-symmetric will uh come together and uh, be symmetric, like a modular, I don't know. Okay, so the, the answer is 
yeah, the non-symmetric ones assemble much, much more than the symmetric one, but that would not have been my naive guess in, in any way, because we are so used to the symmetry, right, and sort of expecting to see symmetry in nature all the time, you sort of expect to see these symmetric things easily assembled. But with these small clusters, it is not the case. And the answer lies in this term for rotational entropy, because it has, so this is just a moment of, moment of inertia, so again, nothing spectacular, very similar for most of them. But there is this term here, one over sigma, and the sigma is the size of the symmetry group. And the more symmetric you are, the more penalized you are for assembly. So actually getting any kind of, of the symmetric structures that form out, uh, in, in, that you can form in, uh, with these spheres, it's, it's like it's very hard hard to see them. And um, yeah, so this is, uh, again, from naturalist dissertation, uh, but you can see how huge the difference can be. So at six particles, so there are two, uh, two different structures. One is very symmetric, this first one, and the other is not symmetric at all. You can see the symmetry uh, ratio, the size of the symmetry group. And the probability to see the, the, the non-symmetric one is 96, and the probability to see the symmetric one is only 4%. And it goes down as well. So here at eight, the most symmetric ones you basically don't see at all. And this was, a, this was just theoretical calculation, and then they did also experiments, and we did the simulations to try to, to check this. And so I will just skip over the simulation details and just go straight to the results. So this is uh, from the theory and, sim and experiments. So this is for these uh, uh, six particle clusters, two different structures, experiments and, and uh, uh, theory match very well. And then we did simulations for the same thing. And this is what we observe. So this is the relative yield as a function of temperature. And so these lines, very thin lines that you maybe see, are basically the results from theory. And then the dots are basically the average yield over thousands of different simulations that we've done, uh, where we looked at which structure forms. And at very low temperatures, things are just kinetically trapped. You, they, where, where they end up, this is where they stay. But at some point, you start switching some equilibrium behavior, and we get the same results as the theory and the experiment. And so this is just how, so basically how the in simulations, what we do. So we measure the second moment, basically, which tells you how spherical structure is. And it's very interesting because you can see this flipping between different structures. So these particles really, they, they don't have any um, DNA on top, so they're just colloidal particles interacting with short-range interactions, and these are de depletion interactions. So temp if given the temperature, these bonds between them can, can break, and so this is what's happening. So most of the time, the structure stays in this, um, uh, this non-symmetric state, and then sometimes it goes a little bit to the symmetric one, goes back, and so on. It's a, it's a very... Uh, so this is how we actually calibrated our, our simulation. So we calibrated to these systems and then compared to the other, other system sizes. This is for seven particles. Again, lines are results from here in experiments and then points are the results from the simulations. And again, at some point in temperature, we start seeing the behavior that is, that is predicted and observed in, in experiments. And again, so this guy is extremely symmetric. So you basically don't see it at all. Whereas things that are really not very symmetric, you see them all the time. And of course, from these images, there is no way you can see what is symmetric, what is not. But I have some toys. I forgot to bring them now. But um, I can bring them tomorrow so you can, you can try to see how they look like. And so we've done this for, uh, for many different uh, system sizes. They won't bore you with details. The, the main thing is that it's, uh, it's, um, we've, we've made sure the simulation that we have is well calibrated to these experiments. Okay, but now as we talked at the, and we started with the beginning, right, in these biological systems, you have these complicated structures that are made out of building blocks that all have specific interactions. And it's not that when you take these building blocks, you end up getting, you know, hundreds of different 
structures. You know, you always get, you know, a ribosome or a microtubule or, or what's the transcription factor. So, of course, the natural question that you can ask is what kind of, you know, uh, interactions basically do I need to, these particles need to have if I just want to get assembly of one specific structure, not all 13. So, I want to control basically what is it that happens. Yeah, so it looks like the match with the theoretical prediction yeah. is better at high temperatures rather than at low temperatures. Yeah. Uh, is it because they're getting trapped in some... Yeah, so it's, it's exactly, yeah, sorry, so it's exactly that. What happens is that these, so it's, um, so the, these least symmetric structures, because these are just spheres, they're identical spheres, are basically just stacks of tetrahedra. And uh, it's very easy to make this, you can just imagine, if you would add, be adding one by one particle, yeah. this is a state that you would end up with just tetrahedra uh, forming one, one on top of each other. And so at low temperature, they just get stuck. And whatever motion is happening, they very easily go back into yeah. the state, uh, in their own state. They're exploring a little bit their, their minimum, but, but it's, they're basically just fluctuating around around that, because to uh, actually switch to any of the different structure, you know, they, they have to, you know, break a bond and roll over and do a, a huge motion. So up to some point, they just don't have enough, enough, there's no enough energy, they're just trapped. And only later, they actually start uh, uh, behaving as the equilibrium calculation uh, predicted. I mean, I showed just these are just ensemble averages. We do also time averages and confirm that things start to match basically at some temperature like this. Yes. Oh, so <clears throat> you get a very good PhD student. You make sure they're not in Europe because three years for a PhD is not going to do the work. So you want them to be in the US. You want them to have six to seven years of their PhD. And then you make sure they have a very good eyesight and that they enjoy these things very much. And you give them a set of toys and a very good microscope and then leave them alone for a while. And then they look and look and look and try to identify. It's really hard. It's so, really so then hard. they are just watching movies or pictures and count? They're constantly watching movies and counting and checking and because these particles are identical, right? So they, they're not labeled with anything, so you cannot distinguish them. So it's really painful. But it was necessary to do if you want to use this as a model system, right? Because, you know, theory can do one thing, is equilibrium calculation is one. Once you go to an experiment, who knows that things can be very different. So, yeah, so that's the recipe, and really, the guy was amazing, so it's, uh, that's the only thing that I can say. I mean, none of these things would have been ever done without PhD students. It's, uh, I think this is clear. But uh, yeah, so it was a very, very painful. For us, I mean, for simulations, of course, it's easy. You know where, what the positions of particles are. You can calculate all kinds of things to, make, to confirm, to make sure that this is a structure that we are identifying. We don't have to stare at the movies. Although I did, you know, for every just randomly selecting things to make sure that uh, they are well identified. But it's a really, really a hard process. Okay, so we want to only make one structure out of many that are possible. And so we somehow have to be able to put information in our system in some sense. And as I already mentioned, you can do a simple way to do it is just using DNA because it's, it's widely available and easy to use. And uh, so the, and this is exactly what we, what well, my colleagues do. They take these single strands of DNA, they have a way to glue them on the surface of the particles and to give them identity, to make them distinguishable, okay? And now the, the very important part is that when these particles come together, in this case, they can, sort, they can roll 
so they're not confined uh, under a certain angle wherever they bounce. So they can actually roll over the entire surface uh, of the particle. And so the question is then how do we find the design? Well, this is where all these hard work that mathematicians did is, of course, extremely necessary because you can ask a question, so what kind of interactions I need such that I only get this one and then none of the other structures. And for example, a result for, for this structure would be um, interaction matrix on this. So it has eight uh, different uh, building blocks. White means they don't like each other and gray means they actually like uh, like each other. And uh, for most of the things that I will tell you today, um, we just have these binary values. So they either like each other and with some, uh, with some uh, attraction energy epsilon or they don't like each other. And then they, they just don't uh, interact. Okay? And so now the interesting thing is that, now of course it depends on the cluster, but uh, sometimes you get just one solution for a design, and sometimes you can get many different solutions. And so the, we call these solutions alphabets, okay? And so this is for the, for the six particle case. This is the simplest one where we start seeing the generacy in the number of the ground states uh, available. You can, for, for the non-symmetric cluster, there are two alphabets. For a symmetric one, there is only one. At seven, you know, they go up to four. But then at eight, for example, if we can have one cluster that has 26 different solutions, at nine, we have clusters that have 200 different solutions. So basically what I'm telling you is that there are 200 different matrices that code only for one structure and none of the other ones. There are some structures that are highly designable and some that are, that are not. And another thing that came out from this, uh, from this theory is that usually um, if you want to try to uh, simulate structures with, it, with all these, so just fix a structure, look at all the alphabets that, uh, that uh, design, for, design her, design that structure, you can just simulate the, the assembly and check the yield. And usually the maximum alphabet, so the one that is the largest alphabet, should give you the best result, okay? This came out of the, the theory as an, important, as an important result. And so we decided to test this. And so here, this is what I'm showing you. So these are the results from our simulations. And so these are now the simulations that we calibrated to experiments of identical particles. And now we're just doing uh, particles that we, which we allow to have some uh, specific interactions. And so as I said, for six particles, so this is the just the adjacency matrix saying which particle is in contact with which geometrically. And so these are the two different designs. So you can have either five different types of building blocks or just three different building blocks. And this is the result. So this is the yield as a function of temperature. Now this top curve here is when the particles are identical, okay? And now this, the, the small ellipses are when you have five different building blocks and squares are when you have three different building blocks. So clearly, if you have five different building blocks, it's better than three, but they're still uh, lower in yield than when you have just all particles identical. And I will come back to this case later. But this is the interesting case. So remember this octahedron that is highly symmetric, has only one design. And when the particles are identical, you basically don't see it at all. You see it, you know, 4% of the time. But once you put a little bit of uh, information into the system, all of a sudden, your yield, you know, dramatically changes. And the reason is that you're basically killing this one over sigma term in the rotational entropy case. It doesn't exist anymore because things are becoming distinguishable. So it's not... One question. I didn't get the other two matrices. Sorry? I didn't get the other two matrices. First one is adjacency. 
this this matrix. This is a density. This is just the density. So ah, these are just the interaction matrices. So here there are particles labeled one, two, five, one, colored with uh, red, blue, purple, light blue, and green. And uh, so these numbers correspond to these colors. Okay, so this it's written six here, but it should be five. Okay, so the the color number one corresponds to the first row, first column of the matrix. Number two, second row, second column. So these are this is this corresponds to the particle species that comprise the the structure. So it's not the adjacency matrix; it's just the interaction matrix. Does that uh, make sense? Maybe this is the easier to explain. So there are six particles, but there are three particle types in the system. So two blue, two red, two green. Okay, and so within the same color, you don't like each other. So diagonal is white, and you like all the other colors. Is that okay? Okay. Okay. And so this is, that was a very simple case, but this is a, an interesting example. So again, a structure this with this adjacency matrix, and when all the particles are identical, this is the most bottom curve you see as a yield, so the lowest one. So whatever flavors you add, they're going to be better than when the particles are identical. So this is number one, number uh, one observation. The second one is that, so this is the, this what we call the largest alphabet, what, which I said, so when everyone is com different, okay, and you like only your neighbors and no one else, this gives you the best yield. And so all these other alphabets are just small, either smaller, like in this particular case. So instead of eight by eight, you here have something that's five by five. You can make the same structure with just five species instead of eight. But these guys are very interesting. This is also an eight by eight matrix, but it has an extra element compared to this maximal alphabet, okay? And this extra element is what we call a crosstalk element. So there can be an interaction between particle, what is it, number five and number six, although they're not in contact in the, in the final structure. And so sometimes this crosstalk element is very detrimental. You can see that it actually doesn't improve the yield compared to the case when you don't have that element. And sometimes if it's in a different position, can actually do very similarly to when you are the when you are very when you are just all different. So there are some interactions that can actually, although they are not there in the final structure, they can be very helpful for you in the when you're assembling in the in the final structure. Okay, and so we we looked at all the different structures and all the different alphabets. And I'm just showing you just some, some parts of this data because what we wanted to understand is are there some rules or regularities behind all these data that we had in this huge amount of data. And so this is just uh, some cumulative plot of the maximum yield as a function of the system size. Okay, so we just looked up to up to 10. And you can see that there is this trend that goes downwards in terms of a yield, right? So already at 10 particles, it's a, <laughs> the yield is going down. So then of course, then you naturally ask, okay, so how the hell are we going to make a, you know, a ribosome with 70 or 80 different building blocks I mean, here and not I mean, something bigger like you cannot even dream about it if this goes down. Right, so this is number one. And then the second question is, we need to understand what are the competing states. So what is killing the yield? Because if we understand what is killing the yield, we can actually try to improve and correct that. Okay. And so then we started trying to understand what kills the yield. And to be able to do that, and this is the beauty of working with these small clusters, is that you can actually look at the, and find what are the energy landscape, the assembly landscape for these structures. And so this is what I'm showing you here. So for this, this is for that six particle cluster that is made out of three colors. So this is the ground state. 
And these are basically all the states that all the structures that can be made, starting with five bonds in a structure, all up to the ground state level to 12, which the ground, this, this guy had. Okay, so there are all the, in completely enumerated, all the possible structures. Now you have two sets of lines, blue and red. Blue means that if you end up in, on a blue line, anywhere where you go, so whatever your next all that structure is, it's completely funneled. You will end up in the ground state, okay? But if you're on a red pathway, that means that there is still a chance that you will end up in something that we call a local minimum. This is a structure that is higher in energy than the ground state. It has an error, so it's not the one that we, that we want. But it's such an error where you have to put in energy to be able to transition to the ground state. So you have to break some bonds to be able to transition. So there is no direct path uh, to the ground state. And so we started doing things like this and looking at different, developing algorithms, first of all, to enumerate these things. Now, I mean, for, for small structures, you know, up to 10, you can sort of, you can sort of do these things, but it becomes more and more painful to, to do this. So we had to, figure out all kinds of ways to do it, but we can now do it for relatively, you know, seven, for 10, 12, up to 14 different, uh, up to 14 uh, particles in a structure. You can find these um, landscapes. So this is an, again an example with eight particles. Again, the color, the colors are such that there, there is one color that means that whatever structure, whatever is beneath you on that pathway, on, on that colored pathway, you will end up uh, in a state associated with the color. And so this is this is uh, what I found completely fascinating for me, which is fascinating. So you start from these uh, particles, and then at some point, you made all of your key bonds. Although you're not completely assembled, right? So it's still some floppy polymeric polymeric structures. But you just made a few of the key bonds between your particles, and then whatever happens to you, however you turn around the pole, you will end up where you want to go, in the ground state or in the case, some other case in the local minimum. So it's, it's very, it's defined, it's um, just a few particles, just a few bonds can completely define the final structure uh, that uh, thing ends up in. And of course, there are many more pathways where it's, it's, it's uh, unclear. But this was very important for the experiments because this means that if they want to get always the ground state, they, don't ha they can somehow start the system from a, a situation where they have already a few well-chosen bonds, and then it will just naturally go down where they want it to go. Yes. Yes, just to be sure to understand this graph. So it means that at the end, in your jar, for example, you will end up with only these uh, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six states, final states? Yeah, exactly. You will end up in one of these guys. Correct. It seems to be a very restricted number of, uh, of stable states. Well, but this is this is by design. Uh, this is exactly what, what all those matrices do. It's completely by design. So these matrices are designed such to such that to eliminate all the other ground states. But then, what you have left competing with are some higher order kinetic traps, local minima, that are competing with you. And now, of course, as the size of the structure grows the number of these competing states also, also grows. But uh, so for these, for these small ones, so in this case just six, there is only one competing state in this case. But as you go to higher, to, to larger systems, you have more, more and more. But um, I, as I said, I didn't tell you anything about the kinetics on this, on this graph. So not all the pathways are equally likely and some are some are more, so there are weights here as well that can be calculated. And although uh, in some cases, 
um, like here, you know, you have six, six states. So there are some pathways that are really unlikely. So actually even a very, very small probability you end up in these guys, much higher probability you end up. And, and you, then you can't be cycling between these transient states. It's not possible. You are making bound bounds, and at the end, you, you fall in one of these uh, ground states. Uh, also, in, our sim in the simulations, you, you, can, you just run them for a very long time, and you just explore this entire thing. So bonds break and form all the time. So you don't make them irreversible. Okay. So they can actually transition between, between, between different states. Okay, so maybe I skip this and just show you actually an experiment. So we've done this in experiments as well. So well, my colleague, when I say we, it's people, they say royal we, so other people done this, not, not me definitely. So with this octahedron case, this very simple matrix, we you know, the energy landscape is very simple. We can find all the transition paths. We can also find the number of pathways so to connect the transition. We can just know exactly what happens. And this is the result from the experiments. So when they match relatively well, this is another example. This is with nine, nine different um, uh, particles, the same interaction matrix. So now the same matrix can actually also code for a much larger structure, well, much, nine is larger than six, so in our eyes is much, much larger structure. And these are the lowest energy local minima. And there we can nicely see one of the states uh, match the experiments, but the other two not. And then that helped us actually, because it was very disappointing seeing, seeing this, that helped us realize in the experiments that there is an, there is an issue. There was a, um, most likely what's happening is that some of the DNAs on one of the particles are degraded and when the bone bond forms, it's, it's a permanent one, it doesn't break anymore. And that messes up the balance between the seeing the ground state and the, and the local minimum because just to transition from here to here, you're just breaking one of, the, one of the bonds. And this is what we're now trying to test in, just in simulations to block one bond and see if we can this change in the in the distribution of uh, in the yield of different uh, structures, but um, the main thing is that we can we can test this in experiments as well. Okay, so we sort of saw that we can do things on a small scale. We sort of understand what the competing states are, and we can we can find them. But then the question, the other question that I that I had on the on on these. Uh, this plot is, you know, can we ever imagine making something huge? And my colleagues were obsessed with this structure of a uh, big event. So there was a huge uh, exhibition in Paris a decade ago or so, where people who obviously have time, I don't know, I mean, it takes weeks and weeks to build this, were building different structures from these geomags. So these are magnetic sticks and balls. And so my colleagues really wanted to make a structure of a Big Ben using colloidal particles. And so this is our rendition of Big Ben, much smaller, of course, is around 70 particles. Not very big, but big enough for us. But still, if you know this is 10, this is 70, <laughs> it doesn't seem like we're going to see much. And this is really puzzling because we know that biology does it. So the ribosome, 70 plus different building blocks. So it, it definitely works. And uh, this was the example of these DNA Lego pieces that I, that I showed previously. So these guys had 1,000 uh, 1, different building blocks, okay? And they just put them in and wait a while, and they assemble all these structures, okay, that they coded for. So it has to be possible to make this. We just were puzzled, um, how is this happening? And so we did a simulation. We actually just decided, let's just do a simulation. Let's just design the, the structure. Let's just put in interaction matrix and just run a simulation. It's the same simulation we've used for all these things so far. 
and let's just see what happens. If it doesn't assemble, we'll start looking it into why it's not happening. And I think it's done. It's soon soon going to be over. But basically, what you're seeing is it's sort of forming this shape that we designed, sort of. And there's one or two particles left. Now they can all break bonds and form bonds all the time. Of course, it's much harder if they have a lot of a lot of bonds. But then eventually, okay, I think I will stop because this is okay, it's not unfortunately it's not showing me way to stop. But okay, you sort of you sort of saw it's sort of assembled, okay? And so this is a yield as a function of temperature. So this uh, this uh, yellowish uh, circle is the yield for this particular structure. And this is just the design that we that we used. And you can see that there is a, we have a temperature range where this yield is around you know, 60 around 60 percent. We looked at other structures, and so this one has 19 particles. So it has, it's like a it's like a chiral structure, a long chiral, well, longish kind of structure, 19. And this is the the green yield, so the lowest out of all. This one has also 19. That's this one. Okay. This is 44. That's the red one. So the two 19 ones, so obviously different different structures, the same number of particles, but they can have a very, very dramatic difference in yield. So clearly we can assemble structures that are larger than just uh, you know, six or eight particles, but then the question is what actually governs the yield? And we basically, what we started doing, we started looking at the energy landscape of these things. And now, so 69 factorial is a huge number. Okay, so it becomes much harder to find this. But what we started with is trying to find what are just the lowest energy states in this energy landscape. So what are the lowest energy competing states? And so that's actually doable. And we enumerated for all these structures these lowest energy local minima and competing states. And what I'm plotting here is yield as a function of, so this is yield, the, the, this is just the partition function for the ground states, normalized by the partition function for the ground, plus the, all the partition functions from all the local minima that we found, that we enumerated. And so this is here just the number of local minima, and you can see that in, as the energy grows, so uh, the, their number grows rapidly, of course. But then on the other side is the yield, this is just, uh, this, um, sorry, I'm, I'm not being uh, clear, but basically each, at each and this at every point, we are just including some fraction of the competing states and looking at what is happening with the yield. And the interesting thing is that the yield actually plateaus after a while. And so although this number of local minima, of course, grows with their energy, the, their contribution, because it's just basically a, a Boltzmann factor, their contribution, uh, it's, not, it's, not very, it's not very big. So it, they're very costly. They're not influencing the yield uh, at all. And so I will just show you for, for these different structures we looked at. This is, again, the, the, this tower structure. This is the square by pyramid, so it's this guy, and this is the chiral chain, so the, this one. And so this one sort of plateaus around 50%. The square by pyramid is the best. It goes up to 80%. And then in the chiral chain case, uh, it goes to, I don't know what, it's very small. And I, you should not be looking at the numbers, although they sort of, match what we see, so, but ignore the numbers. The main thing is that this idea that the lowest energy local minima are the most detrimental and impact the yield the most was, seems to be a correct assumption and it matches our observations 
from the simulations. And we can, of course, go into the simulations and check these remaining percent. So, I don't know, at a given temperature, let's say here, we identify that there are 60% of the tower structures, but we can look at what are all the other structures that are formed up to, to 100%, and we really find that these are just these lowest energy local minima um, that we find. Okay. And now, of course, the question that experimentalists really, really want to know, so how can we improve yield? So this is, of course, for them very important, because if they have something that's only, you know, 10, 15 percent, that's very, very bad experiment for them. They want to have something that works all the time very well. And so to be able to do this, we had to go back to our, to our energy landscapes. Yes. Can you go, can you repeat? If you look at the lowest energy state, yeah. is that degenerate or uh, is it? Uh... Uh, no, so the, these designs are such that they exclude any degeneracy. So this only one, well, okay, so I'm, I'm lying. So whenever a structure has some natural mirror symmetry, then your, your state is actually, you have two states, you don't have, to have a mirror symmetry right. as well. I don't understand the graph in the middle, for example. The lowest yeah. energy state has 20 local minima at the lowest possible value of the local minima. Exactly. So there are 20 states which are related by a certain symmetry. So there, oh, so there, there, are 20, uh, there are 20 states that differ from the, from the ground state. Okay. Okay. And uh, they are higher in energy. Okay. So they have uh, they have five bonds less than the ground state. Oh, okay, this is relative to the ground state. Yes, it? exactly. Sorry, yes, it's related to the ground state. It's all related to the ground state. Correct. Okay. So uh, yeah, exactly. And so and they seem this they seem to be the the most detrimental to the to the yield. Everything else is very expensive and and we rarely see. And the chiral chain, why does the number of local minima go down with energy? It's, you know, it's quasi one dimensional object. It's all in defect. It's so easy to, to, to make an error there. It's much harder to make an error here. So here you can make an error on the surface, but to do this, you have to break a lot of bonds, right? Here you can break, you know, two and you are in a, in an error state. And there are many ways in which you can just break two. And, and end up in an error state. And this is what's happening. You know, there are 40 something immediately with very low energy, just one bond different from the ground state, it just kills the yield. Because in that, uh, in that um, expression, which I didn't go into much detail uh, just now, right, you have the, the, Boltzmann factor, so if this is just, and here you have just the energy of the, of the local minima and the number of states. Okay? And so you have a lot that, that just have small energy, so it just kills the yield. Whereas with the other guys, these are very costly, so just the exponential just kills everything. It doesn't matter how many of them you have here. Okay, so how do we improve yield? Sorry. So we went back to our landscapes and started looking at, again, in much detail at all the possible pathways towards, so this is like a ground state, this is a design, these are the different lowest energy local minima, and then it doesn't matter what's written on these arrows, but basically it's telling you about how many bonds you need to break to go from one state to another, and how many different ways you can do that. This is all, we can find all this, all this data. And then we did a little bit of what's known as transition state theory. And originally I was planning to, because this is very, very cool and interesting, I was planning to do some things on the board, but I decided not to. And then if someone is interested, we can do it in one of the tutorials. So this is what I suggest. And this is a very nice paper by, by Eric on the Nyman. But uh, so basically, if you have, 
information about all the possible pathways that connect the ground states to local minima and how many bonds you need to break to go from one state to another. Basically, a probability to be in one state can be, at some point in, uh, in time, can be related to the probability later in time through some matrix, a transition state matrix that basically has information about the number of pathways and number of bonds broken between them. And once you have that, you can actually ask optimization questions. And so I'm just showing you very, uh, very, very, one very simple example. So this is the, the ground state. And uh, here at the bottom, this uh, open circles is the yield for when we just have bonds being of equal strength. Okay, so there are no differences between bonds. But if we do this uh, Markov chain optimization we, and use what the, what the model uh, says we should, uh, we should do, which is make some of these bonds, which are here marked in black, stronger than the others, okay? We run the simulation again, and it actually improves the yield. And uh, Not, um, of course, at the very, very beginning, we thought that we are smarter than the Markov chain optimization. And <laughs> we actually decided, look at this beautiful here, half ring here. So what if we just make those bonds much, much stronger? It's sort of intuitive if the chain forms first, then the rest will just fall together. And if you, if you do that, you kill the yield completely. Um, so it's important to, to know, to understand what, it, what this, uh, optimization actually do, does. And what it does, it basically, it looks at which bonds you need to break to go from one state to the other, okay? And then those ones from the ground state to the local minima you make stronger. And on the other side, it looks at the local minima and looks at the bonds that you need to break to go from the local minima to ground state and makes those ones weaker. So if you end up in a local minimum, it's easy for you to go to the ground state. But if you end up in a ground state, it's much harder to go to the local minimum. So you're basically shaping the energy landscape a little bit. And this is what allows you to improve the, improve the yield. Okay? So the theoretical calculation, which was saying that if the bond strengths are, are when they're identical, it, that should give you the best yield is actually not, not correct. And we sort of expected that this is not the case just because we know from biology not all the bond strengths are the same. There is a huge variation between uh, strengths of, uh, between different building blocks. Okay, and so I will just end, end with that for today. So specific interactions are crucial. In principle, you know, the more diff of different building block types you have, the better your yield. Lowest energy local minima are the ones that are the most detrimental for the yield. And as I said, the equal bond energy is not the best solution always. And we, of course, need met more methods for correcting errors. And this leads me back to the, my second slide. And uh, we've heard about interactions and structures and all kinds of things. So I'm curious if you have some ideas of what would be a genotype, a phenotype, landscape, mutations, etc. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Um, trying to think of the relation of what you said to biological structures. You mentioned the ribosome. One thing that this modeling does not seem to make use of is selection. Mm -hmm. And why are you doing that? Because the ribosome probably began as a baby ribosome mm -hmm. and gradually grew to where it is now. We're just not there yet. So we started from a model where we know what are all the possibilities and then we slowly started adding ingredients, right? The first ingredient was just adding interactions and seeing how can we control them to get certain structures. We haven't used anything, like, I mean, it's, it's not there yet. We are not doing any kind of... What I mean is, 
are you making the problem more difficult for yourself than you should be? Um, uh, well, possibly, but if we understand what are all the possibilities and all connections between the all, all of the states, it allows us much better to understand what can be done. I think that, that uh, because we're not making one specific thing, right? I mean, it's, we're not building a rival zone yet. Maybe I'm not understanding your question. My understanding has not, uh, my question, I beg your pardon. My question has nothing to do with what you have done and the uh, physics of it. Yeah. it. It's just to do with the analogy to the biological system. Yes. Uh, biological systems probably grow, so to speak, in a functional sense by accretion, mm -hmm. which means by making use of selection. Whereas it seems to me you're really trying to solve a very difficult problem, which is not the problem that was solved by evolution. Uh, okay. Uh, I mean, it's, uh, yeah, it's, uh, we are not doing what, what uh, evolution is doing. And I think that once we start going to larger systems, that we will have to use different kinds of, different kinds of approaches to actually explore the system. But for these small ones, although it is hard, we can still find all the possible solutions and try to see if there are, there are rules and regulations and, and design, well, design rules that we can extract because, um, yeah, because we just know what are all the possibilities. But maybe we can talk about that later just because I think I'm not, I'm not answering your question. So these are equilibrium simulations, right? So, so they all obey detail balance. And so maybe you said this and I lost this. So is there a general principle that if I want a particular structure, I know how to design the interaction matrix? Yeah. So for these uh, small ones, right, you, it's basically, it's, it's a, you're solving a combinatorial problem. You know what are all the possible ones. And then you, you start going through all the possible interaction matrices of, of a certain size, maximal size meaning the, just the size of the, the system, and you check what structures can be made. And you search, it's a brute force approach, so you search through them until you find the ones that are where none of the other ones form, and the ones that you have doesn't violate the bonds in the structure that you want to build. These larger structures, what we use is just, let's make everyone different. You make, you like your, only your neighbor, your nearest neighbor, and no one else. And, that's in, and this works, except that if your structure naturally has this mirror symmetry, you end up having uh, a chirality or something. So you get two states instead of just one. But that was the, the recipe that we used. Having everyone different is just the simplest. So people have looked at these things, for example, in spin glasses, where you try to enumerate all possible uh, states per finite sized uh, lattice systems and then trying to map out the energy landscape. Uh, but there it's some random interaction plus minus j or something like that that you put in. But here you're designing the interaction depending on the uh, matrix. So it's, 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 it's not clear. I mean, is this like an inverse problem that I should think about that I have the structure, I want the interaction. Yes, exactly. It's, like, it's always like that. We start from what we want to get and then search for interactions that will give us that. It's right. the inverse problem. But, but since it's equilibrium, uh, you should also know the kinetics, right? How fast will you get to one state and how fast will you get to the... Yeah, so the design is completely, it's uh, equilibrium and uh, so far, I mean, of course, the simulations are not. I mean, it's equilibrium simulation, but you can exp you can find the transition pathways and the, the kinetics. You find it, but the the kinetics comes in only only later once we start looking at all the transition pathways and the barriers between, and then actually optimizing and you know shaping, refilling the landscape. But everything else is just equilibrium. Yeah, and for this, it, it's it's okay. I mean, unless you, are, you have an experiment like we ended up having where you're degraded and you're just stuck in one place and then you have to do different kinds of simulations where you actually have irreversible bonds or stuff like that, in which case it's not a anymore. Okay. 
most of it is just experiment. I'm just curious uh, that how much time it takes to simulate like 69 sy uh, bit system? Oh, it's very fast. Very fast. Yeah, it's very fast. It's, uh, so we use these, um, the slide that I skipped, so dissipative particle dynamic simulations. So we explicitly model the solvent. So there are millions of small particles that are also floating around and we have colloids. And so solvents we model as soft spheres which can sort of also penetrate and these are, these are giving us, the, this is our bath, that's our bath. And the colloids are just basically hard spheres with a very, very short range, Leonard Jones-like potential, but very sharp cutoff. And so it's not a huge system, it's really a small system. So you can, you can easily, you know, in a few minutes, you're, you have many simulations. And it just, yeah, it's just very fast. The, this is the advantage of the, the DPD type of simulation because your bath it has this soft potential. You don't have to resolve your, your um, integration time steps are huge. You don't have to resolve things very well at all. You only resolve your time step when you're looking at the, these colloidal particles, which is just a few particles, that's nothing. But if you have, um, and you have millions of the other ones, right? so it's much easier, very fast. So this will be the case even if you define um, different set of interaction as in for each of the parts. Yeah, okay, cool. Very, very fast. I love this method and it's, it's very nice. What I didn't say is because in, in the long time scales and large systems, it has a proper higher dynamic behavior. You would expect for systems like this. This is the reason why we took it because we really wanted to study in the experiments all the effects of solvents and adding different things on the assembly and for that we needed something that has the proper higher than any material. Huh. So will it be interesting to ask how the geometry of the colloid particles will affect the whole thing? For example, if we replace sphere by cuboids or uh, it will be just like adding one additional parameter and complicating the whole thing. No, so no, it's a, it's a, it's a very good question. So we started with spheres just because we wanted to have the most freedom, so the least constraints. But yeah, the, the, in colloidal experiments, they can make all kinds of shapes. It's, it's really like a zoo of things. It's amazing what they can, they can do. And mostly so far, they have been again studying lattices and then trying to use these different shapes to get different uh, lattices. Yeah, you can, you can definitely do that. Uh, uh, for, for me, that adds more constraints to the system, so this is why uh, we, are not, we are not doing that. But the, the hope is that if we understand you know, how things can be done, then it doesn't matter which system you use, even if it has more constraints, you can tell your recipe of, of uh, how you can do that. But yeah, we haven't tried anything with different shapes. But it's it's an, really an, a thing to do because there is an, an experiment. It's like so rich. It's an, it's incredibly rich. You can do all kinds of funky things. Yes, I was trying to to answer or <clears throat> to think about these two questions. <laughs> yes, because, because you asked. Um, so phenotype seems to be the, the shape of the final structure, okay, but for the genotype, I think there is no genotype in, in this model. <laughs> because if we think about this interaction matrix, okay, which defines the, the structure, this information is not encoded by a kind of arrangement of, of this particle, it's not, a, it's not a physical information. It seems that it, it's this interaction matrix is more about the physical rules, for example, between amino acids, uh, the bounds that they can have. Okay. Um, so but that was just. <laughs> oh, okay, this is great. Okay, thank you. Okay, so if there are no more questions, let us thank our speaker for a marvelous. Lecture.